Hello, my name is Jeff Borer, and in this segment, I'm going to be talking about one of the new agents that's been developed recently for heart failure, that is Ivabradine. The overall learning objective of this program is to integrate Ivabradine into patient management. The learning objectives of this module are that after completing this activity, the learner will be able to describe the mechanism of action of Ivabradine in heart failure, describe the benefits of Ivabradine in patients with heart failure, list common adverse events, and select appropriate patients for treatment with Ivabradine. Any discussion of Ivabradine, which acts solely by de depressing heart rate, must begin with a discussion of how heart rate is controlled. Sinoatrial nodal cells have a variety of channels uh, in their cell membranes. Two of those kinds of channels, calcium and potassium channels, leak. And the extent to which they leak results in the generation of a current as the ions move across the channels, either in or out. The current that is developed results in the spontaneous diastolic depolarization of the heart that is the basis of the heart rate. The uh, heart rate is fixed by the characteristics of the calcium and potassium channels in the sinoatrial nodal cells. However, there's another channel, a hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channel, uh, which is sometimes called the F channel, uh, which allows both sodium and potassium to move in and out. The current developed by the, this movement is rather small. However, when it does develop, when the movement of the ions occurs, the F current is a very important current because it modulates the rate of spontaneous diastolic depolarization. As the uh, F current is decreased, as it is depressed, spontaneous diastolic depolarization occurs less rapidly the slope of diastolic depolarization is decreased, and the result is that the heart rate is decreased as well. Ivabradine works by blocking the F channel, and therefore blocking the F current. Uh, when the channel is open, the F current can develop and the spontaneous diastolic depolarization occurs as it normally would. When the channel is blocked by Ivabradine, the F current is cut off, and the result is a diminution in the, sl in the slope of diastolic depolarization and a diminution in heart rate. The impact of Ivabradine on outcomes in patients with systolic heart failure was assessed in the systolic heart failure treatment with the IF inhibitor Ivabradine trial, or SHIFT. The objective of SHIFT was to test the hypothesis that heart rate slowing with Ivabradine improves cardiovascular outcomes, left ventricular function, and quality of life. The patients included in this study were those with moderate to severe chronic heart failure, New York Heart Association functional classes two through four, with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, uh, as indicated by ejection fraction less than or equal to 35%, who had a heart rate of at least 70 beats per minute in sinus rhythm and were receiving guidelines-based recommended therapy, including maximally tolerated guideline recommended doses of beta blockers. About 7,500 patients were screened for shift and, and about 6,500 were randomized. A small number, uh, slightly more than 50 patients, were excluded because of a protocol violation, but the vast majority were followed through to the end, and only three patients in total out of the 6,505 patients remaining were lost to follow-up. The, uh, the median study duration was 22.9 months. Uh, the maximum was 41.7 months, or about three and a half years. The outcomes of SHIFT were rather clear. Heart rate slowing with Ivabradine improved the outcomes in patients with systolic heart failure in a time-to-first event analysis for either hospitalization or worsening heart failure, uh, for worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death. There was an 
reduction in events over two and a half years when Ivabradine was given to patients rather than placebo. The number needed to treat for one year to see this benefit was 26 patients. This rather marked improvement was driven primarily by a reduction in hospitalizations for heart failure. Again, in the time to first event analysis, uh, the reduction in hospitalizations for heart failure reached 26% in patients treated with Ivabradine versus those with placebo, and this is a highly statistically significant uh, result. Now, when patients are followed to first event and the trial continues, as SHIFT did, uh, many events are left behind. They're not counted because they occur after the first event. We then performed a total uh, event analysis. All heart failure hospitalizations during the trial uh, were counted in this one, and here the result was virtually identical with the time to first event analysis, a 25% reduction in hospitalizations due to heart failure when patients were treated with Ivabradine rather than placebo. A second uh, analysis of this total database was performed. This is called a total time approach where we looked at the time to the second event and the time to the third event if a third event occurred or a second event occurred. This total time approach revealed not only that there were fewer second and third hospitalizations among patients treated with Ivabradine than among patients treated with placebo, but also that the time that elapsed from a first hospitalization to a second, or from a second to a third, if a second and third occurred, was significantly longer when patients were treated with Ivabradine rather than when they were treated with placebo. In addition, heart rate slowing with Ivabradine reduced death from heart failure. Again, a time to first event analysis was performed here, uh, but the reduction in heart failure deaths was 26% when Ivabradine was administered rather than placebo. Now, heart rate is a predictor of cardiovascular death uh, or heart, rate ho heart failure hospitalizations in patients with chronic heart failure, and that was shown in an analysis of the placebo group in SHIFT. Uh, that was more than 3,200 patients. Uh, it was found that all of them, of course, entered the trial with one of the inclusion criteria, heart rate greater than 70 beats per minute in sinus rhythm. But as the entry heart rate increased from 70 to 72 to 75 to 80 to the highest quintile, which had a heart rate of at least 87 beats per minute, uh, the adverse outcomes increased in, in step. The, the worst outcomes were seen in the, in the uh, quintile with the highest heart rate, those with at least a heart rate of 87 beats per minute at entry, and the best outcomes were seen in patients with uh, the lowest heart rates at entry, 70 to 72 beats per minute. So we know that heart rate is a risk marker for, uh, for adverse outcomes in patients with chronic systolic heart failure. However, to show that it's a risk factor, that is that if you modify the heart rate, you modify the outcome, we had to do the trial. I've shown you the primary results of the trial, but I haven't shown you mortality results for the entire population. In fact, for the entire population, looking at all patients who were admitted with heart rate at least 70 beats per minute, there was a 9% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, which did not reach statistical significance. However, when the heart rate increased at entry, as the heart rate was higher at entry, the benefits of Ivabradine on mortality became more and more apparent. Uh, in the trial, there was a pre-specified analysis at the median heart rate, which was 77. The European Medicines Agency decided that 77 was uh, perhaps a, a difficult heart rate to, to use as a marker for therapy, so they did a post hoc analysis with uh, assessment of mortality for patients who entered the trial with a heart rate of at least 75 beats per minute. In that analysis, it was clear and statistically significant uh, that Ivabradine reduced mortality, in fact, reduced mortality by 
versus placebo in patients who entered the trial with a heart rate of at least 75 beats per minute. When the entire shift population is considered, in fact, the outcomes depended in large measure on the final heart rate that was achieved. If the heart rate was less than or equal to 60 beats per minute, the outcomes were best. If the outcomes were greater than 75, if the heart rate at the end of the trial was greater than 75 beats per minute, the outcomes were the worst. They were still better than before the, the heart rate had been lowered, but clearly the impact of Ivabradine was its effect on heart rate. The greater the effect on heart rate, the greater the benefits to the patient. Besides reducing hospitalizations and mortality, uh, shift improved quality of life uh, in patients treated with Ivabradine. The Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire was one of the tools that was used to assess the impact of Ivabradine on quality of life. The improvement, although patients began the trial with similar quality of life measures, similar scores on the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, during the trial, the quality of life improved significantly more in people on Ivabradine than on people on placebo. Why did the placebo patients improve? Well, they were being treated very rigorously with guidelines-based therapy that they probably hadn't been getting before, and they're being watched closely. So everybody uh, improved quality of life, but the people on Ivabradine improved significantly more than the people on placebo. In fact, the magnitude of improvement in quality of life score was directly related to the magnitude of heart rate reduction. And this is plausible because heart rate slowing also improved cardiac function in the echocardiographic substudy of shift, which was pre-specified in the original protocol. The change in left ventricular systolic volume index, which was the primary outcome variable for the echo substudy, uh, was significantly greater in the, in the people who received Ivabradine than in the people who received placebo. In fact, in people who received placebo, there was hardly any change at all in systolic volume index. Uh, in the patients who received Ivabradine, there was a large and significant reduction uh, in, in end systolic volume, and the difference between placebo and Ivabradine was highly statistically significant. There was also a difference in ejection fractions, significantly favoring Ivabradine. Now, of course, um, heart rate slowing with any drug would be associated with some adverse events, and that was true in shift with Ivabradine as well. Adverse event rates that were at least 1% higher on Ivabradine than placebo and that occurred in at least 1% of the patients who received Ivabradine included bradycardia. Not surprising, the drug is a heart rate slowing drug. Uh, many more patients, 10% of patients on Ivabradine developed bradycardia during the trial than the 2% who, uh, who developed bradycardia on placebo. Hypertension, at least a transient increase in blood pressure into the hypertension range occurred in 9% of patients on Ivabradine and not quite 8% on placebo. One might wonder whether this is a good thing or a bad thing in patients with heart failure, but uh, those are the data. Atrial fibrillation was not expected, but it occurred more frequently in patients with Ivabradine than on placebo. Atrial fibrillation is relatively common in patients with heart failure, as evidenced by the fact that 6.6% .6 of patients on placebo developed atrial fibrillation during the trial. However, 8.3% of patients with Ivabradine developed atrial fibrillation. That is a, a higher proportion. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the issues that requires monitoring when patients are placed on Ivabradine. And finally, phosphenes, which I would call flashing scotomata, uh, or areas of visual, bright, uh, visual brightness in small regions of the visual field, occurred more frequently in patients on Ivabradine than on placebo, uh, probably related to the fact that Ivabradine blocks H channels, which are very similar to F channels, and are present primarily in the uh, retina of the eye. 
Um, so visual, uh, visual brightness or phosphines occurred in significantly more patients on ivabradine than on placebo. Still, a minority of patients were disturbed by these uh, and most patients did not need to, to stop the drug as a result. Now, ivabradine was studied for heart failure and shift, but it had been studied for other indications as well. The drug is approved in Europe for treatment of patients with angina to prevent uh, to reduce the rate and frequency of angina events, and it does that. Uh, however, the hypothesis was developed that outcome events would be reduced by minimizing heart rate in patients with chronic stable coronary disease. This hypothesis was tested first in the BEAUTIFUL trial. Uh, this included 12,000 patients who were screened with evidence of chronic stable coronary artery disease and a left ventricular ejection fraction no, no greater than 40%. Their heart rate had to be at least 60 beats per minute, and some had mild congestive heart failure. Of those more than 12,000 patients screened, almost 11,000 were randomized, half to ivabradine, five or seven and a half milligrams twice a day, and half to placebo. Uh, all of these patients were analyzed, none were lost. The study duration was about a year and a half on average, uh, maximum three years. And unfortunately, the results showed no benefit of heart rate slowing on the primary composite outcome event, which was cardiovascular death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, or new or worsening heart failure uh, with ivabradine versus placebo. No benefit at all. Very disappointing. Uh, but it wasn't clear that those results were correct. So another trial was, uh, was developed called SIGNIFY. SIGNIFY involved 19,000 randomized patients, half to ivabradine, half to placebo. Uh, the dose of ivabradine used was a little bit higher here. It wasn't five or seven and a half. It could be up to 10 milligrams twice a day of ivabradine versus placebo. <clears throat> the study duration, uh, median, was about two and a half years, and the maximum uh, was a little bit more than three and a half years. And here too, unfortunately, larger trial, slightly different inclusion criteria. Patients in Signify had to have an ejection fraction of at least 40%. Uh, percent. In other words, uh, there was nobody with left ventricular systolic dysfunction. There was no heart failure, nothing. These were pure chronic stable coronary artery disease patients, and yet there was no impact at all of heart rate slowing. Now, uh, how can we explain the differences between sig signify, beautiful, and shift? Well, uh, we can't definitively explain the differences, but there were some characteristics of the trials that may help to explain why the outcomes were different. In beautiful, all patients had coronary artery disease. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, about half of them had functional class two heart failure symptoms that may have been, uh, may have been uh, manifestations of angina without chest pain. Uh, the ejection fraction had to be less than 40%. Uh, 40%. The heart rate had to be greater than 60 beats per minute. And the dose of the drug used was five milligrams twice a day or seven and a half twice a day uh, with, one, with one up titration possible. Signify included patients who had chronic stable coronary disease by the same criteria as beautiful, but none of them had heart failure. If they did, they weren't allowed in the trial. Left ventricular ejection fraction had to be at least 40%. The heart rate had to be at least 70 beats per minute. Uh, and the starting dose was seven and a half milligrams twice a day with the possibility of titrating down to five or up to 10 milligrams twice a day depending upon the achievement of a reduction in heart rate. Shift, uh, 
included patients, all of whom had heart failure. And not only did they have heart failure, they had to have been admitted to the hospital within the previous 12 months at least once for heart failure. They all had a, a left ventricular ejection fraction of no greater than 35%, and they all had a heart rate of at least 70 beats per minute. The starting dose was five milligrams twice a day and could be up titrated to 7.5 milligrams twice a day or down titrated to 2.5 milligrams twice a day. There was one other difference, and that is that deltiazem, a calcium channel blocker, or verapamil, another calcium channel blocker that we generally would not give to patients with heart failure, uh, were used in a modest percentage of patients in Beautiful and in Signify. So there are a number of differences between these trials that may have influenced the outcomes. Signify indicates that the main target of heart rate lowering in cardiovascular disease is the myocardium, the ventricle, not the coronary arteries. When the ventricle is normal, heart rate lowering minimizes transient exercise-induced oxygen consumption and angina, but not adverse outcomes. When the ventricle is damaged, heart rate lowering reduces further damage, that is left ventricular remodeling, and improves outcomes. So what are the clinical implications of these findings? In patients with chronic heart failure and in sinus rhythm with heart rate at least 70 beats per minute and already receiving recommended therapies, isolated heart rate reduction substantially improves outcomes in addition to those achievable with beta blockade, including reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations, improvement in left ventricular function, reduction in total hospitalizations during a prolonged interval, and improvement in health-related quality of life. These benefits reduce the total burden of heart failure for the patient, and the reduction in hospitalizations also can be expected to substantially reduce health care costs. Ivabradane is indicated specifically by the FDA to reduce the risk of hospitalizations for worsening heart failure in patients with systolic heart failure. Appropriate patients would be those who are stable, with symptomatic chronic heart failure, left ventricular ejection fraction no greater than 35%, and in sinus rhythm with resting heart rate at least 70 beats per minute, who are taking maximally tolerated doses of beta blocker, unless beta blockers are contraindicated. Inappropriate patients would be patients with acute decompensated heart failure. Why? Because they weren't studied. We don't know what would happen. Patients whose blood pressure is less than 90 over 50. Why? because arbitrarily they were excluded. Uh, we don't believe that there's a problem uh, giving the drug to hypotensive patients, but there might be. The hypotensive patients were excluded from the trial for prudence, and uh, so they're excluded from, uh, from appropriate use. Patients with six sinus syndrome, sinoatrial block, or third degree AV block shouldn't be receiving the drug unless a functioning demand pacemaker is in place because the drug could worsen the conduction abnormality. Patients with heart rate less than 60 beats per minute shouldn't get Ivabradine. Why? Because the target heart rate was 50 to 60. If there were, uh, patients already are in that range with whatever therapy they're getting, they don't need a drug to further lower their heart rate. Patients with severe hepatic impairment uh, or who are taking drugs that have strong uh, CYP3A4 inhibiting activities also shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't get Ivabradine because Ivabradine is metabolized in the liver specifically by the CYP3A4 system. So if there's a problem in the liver and CYP3A4 is being inhibited, uh, the blood levels of Ivabradine will be different from what you might have expected. And finally, patients who are pacemaker dependent don't need to get Ivabradine. Ivabradine can change the sinus rate, it can't change the pacemaker rate. Women who use Ivabradine should use effective contraception, and pregnant women never should use Ivabradine. Why is that? Uh, pregnant women never were given Ivabradine in any of the clinical studies, but pregnant rats and rabbits were. And in those situations, uh, the offspring born to those mothers occasionally had cardiac structural anomalies. In addition, it's useful to monitor regularly for atrial fibrillation, which can occur a little more frequently with Ivabradine than with placebo, uh, to monitor heart rate to be sure 
that heart rate hasn't decreased to a degree that might be considered excessive and certainly that might cause symptoms in some patients. And uh, Ivabdine is not recommended in the presence of second degree AV block unless a functioning pacemaker is in place because the drug could theoretically worsen the degree of atrial ventricular block. In summary, Ivabradine is an IF inhibitor that slows heart rate. In patients with HEFREF, Ivabradine significantly reduces the frequency of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for worsening heart failure and improves quality of life. Thank you.